Hi, and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. My name is Isabel Ross, and I'm the coach at Peak Endurance Coaching. Episode 65 is a very informative interview with Andre Lagersh. Andre is a cardiologist specialising in cardiac imaging. He completed a PhD at the University of Melbourne and four years of postdoctoral research studying the effect of endurance exercise on the heart in Belgium. <clears throat> Andre works as a cardiologist at St Vincent's Hospital here in Melbourne. He is interested in the interaction between exercise and heart function. Andre is well known for his research within Australia's elite sporting communities and he is regularly asked to provide expert comment or to present to health professionals, community sporting groups and the media. Andre is the director of the National Centre for Sports Cardiology. Do you have injuries or niggles ruining your enjoyment of running and hindering your performance? Running is not just good for our physical health, but also for our mental health. It's important on so many levels to all of us that we can keep running. Come in and see the specialists at Health and High Performance, where they utilise the latest in technology and experience to help you achieve the results you want and are capable of. So head to healthhp.com.au forward slash run or find them on Instagram, Health High Performance. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast. Rating, reviewing and sharing on Facebook or Instagram helps more people find the podcast. In next week's episode, I chat with Alex Hutchinson, author of the book Endure, Mind, Body and the Curious Elastic Limits of Human Performance. I love this book when I read it and Alex is fascinating to talk with. In these times, it's more important than ever to have a structured plan to ensure you maximise your training. The benefit of online training, as I provide, is it doesn't matter what state or country you are in, I can help you reach your athletic peak. Staying committed to your training in this time is one thing you can have control over. If you need an individualised plan, email me, Isabel, at peakendurancecoaching.com.au to chat about a training plan. Have a great week of training and running and stay safe and well and enjoy the interview with Andre. Hi Andre and welcome to the Peak Endurance Podcast. Pleasure. Good Good to be here Isabel. Excellent. Can you tell the listeners a bit about yourself, your athletic background and how you got into sports cardiology? Uh, So my athletic background. Um, So when I was in med school, I became uh, quite obsessed with endurance exercise and particularly triathlon back then. And so in 1996, I took a year out of medicine and went and did the Hawaiian Ironman triathlon. Wow. And then then the plan was, in my mind, was that once I finished medicine, I would go back and do... um, you know, do more Ironman triathlons. But I, I then ended up sort of really, I don't know, kind of falling in love with medicine, if you like. I really found it incredibly interesting. And so my plans of being sort of a, a family doctor part-time and an athlete full-time um, eroded and I, I became, um, got into a specialist training program and uh, continued doing endurance sport, but sort of really changed to running, which was much more, um, sort of time efficient mm. uh, and I've, I've run marathons pretty much ever since but I've, I've, so it's been running alongside um, the, the sort of um, specialist medicine training so I became a cardiologist so a heart specialist in 2008 um, and did a PhD and then a postdoctoral research in, in Belgium um, until 2013 so from about 1998 through to 2010, I was uh, I was partly studying for part or all of that time. Oh wow! Um, and now I work at uh, at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne as a cardiologist, and um, the Baker Institute in in Melbourne, um, down in sort of Paran, um, three days a week doing research, running a sports cardiology lab. Excellent. Wow. So Iron Man in Hawaii, that would have been pretty awesome, I bet. Yeah, it was. It was um I at the time uh 
yeah, I truly was obsessed. And I, I took four months, I went and lived in America for four or five months in Boulder, Colorado, and, and trained with some of the people who, who were like absolute heroes who I had on the bedroom wall. So Greg Welch and Mark Allen and some of these people. Oh, wow. Had. That's awesome. Lucky you. Yeah. And, and a guy in Australia named Chris Lee was living next door when I arrived. So we became great friends and um, trained almost every day together. It was, it was you know, probably the best four months of my life in lots of ways. <laughs> it was, it was yeah, amazing. Okay. But um, it was also a little bit artificial, of course, because I, 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 I spent money. I didn't make any money. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was an incredible experience. And, and it, it's, um, it's been really nice having a career that, that um, runs very much in synchrony with, with some of my passions. Anyone who does endurance sport will know that sort of fascination with what's my body doing, you know, how does, the, how does the metabolism work, how does the heart work, how does the blood pump around, and some of these really simple questions have sort of um, have been attacking ever since in more and more complex ways. Yeah. Yep, I bet. So can you explain to listeners how cardiovascular performance is r related to the, the, what the variables are related, you know, like heart rate, stroke volume, those sorts of things? Yeah, so, so basically when you exercise, you're, you're doing work um, and the harder you exercise, the more work you do. And the amount of work that you do requires more and more energy and most of that energy comes from um, the metabolism of oxygen with with other you know substrates like like sugar basically, mm. but um, the, really simply the the harder you work the more oxygen you need, and um, where the heart comes into that is that the heart's what pumps the oxygen around, uh, the oxygen's carried by the blood pumped around by the heart, and the way in which the heart pumps more blood to the muscles is um, is by pumping more quickly, so hence your heart rate goes up and pumping more blood. And it does that by stretching um, a little bit more than it does at rest to allow more blood in. Um, but also particularly it squeezes down more aggressively during exercise so that the stroke volume, the amount of blood pumped with every, every beat um, is more. The main thing that separates, because if you look at non-athletes, mm. their <laughs> cardiac output, so their pump, um, will increase from about five, six litres per minute at rest and go up to somewhere around 10 to 15 litres per minute for the average sort of fitness person. Whereas your athlete will go up to, you know, 25, 30 litres. In fact, you know, we, we measured the highest cardiac output that I've ever seen directly measured, and that was 37.8 litres per minute in a Tour de France cyclist. So oh, wow. essentially your heart can pump 40 litres per minute. And, and if you, you know, to put that in some sort of, if you go out into the garden, turn on your hose really quite, you know, quite a lot, that's 40 litres per minute. It's an it's incredible amount of flow. It's um, yeah. And the amount of blood with every stroke in a well-trained athlete, you know, with every beat, it's pumping about to, in a really well-trained athlete, can be as much as sort of 150 to 200 mil. So it's, um, uh, if you think about sort of half a can of Coke being pumped three times per second, it's, it's really impressive. What's also impressive is that's sort of the heart pumping, but the amount that it pumps out is exactly the same amount as it fills. You know, blood goes yeah. in, blood comes out, and the, the, it has to be the same what goes in comes out type thing. And, and if you think about, you know, the heart pumping 30, 40 litres per minute, the fact that it can fill in that sort of time is yeah. really incredible. It's, like it's like a Dyson vacuum cleaner. Um, that that then pumps it all out, all in the all in the size of about you know three fists. It's um, yeah. it's an incredible organ. Yeah, I mean the human body is an amazing thing. How all of this works, you know, and we don't even notice it half the time. Yeah. And so, what is the effect of long term endurance training on the heart? Which is, I know, a very big question. Yeah, so there's there's the good and the bad, and the good is is ninety five percent of the equation, and the bad is five percent gets ninety five percent of the media attention, but it's a small. Um, the first thing, sort of the headline, I'll probably come back to it and repeat it a few times, but athletes live longer, 
and they have better health outcomes. On average, that's absolutely clear. That's been studied in across the population. It's been studied in big populations of Olympic athletes, in Tour de France cyclists. You know, athletes live longer, and um, and generally have also better health in every domain, musculoskeletal. You know, even though you hear everyone will tell you, oh, you're running your knees yeah. into the ground. It's actually not true. You know, runners have very good um, bone and joint health, uh, less cancer, less diabetes, less everything. It's, it's really spectacularly healthy, even at the highest end of, of um, athletics. What happens to the cardiovascular system? The, the, the biggest thing that happens is the heart gets bigger. Um, so it enlarges, you know, 10, 50, 100 percent. You know, often we see athletes with hearts that are that are more than twice the size of a normal heart. Um, the amount that the heart grows is proportional, is reasonably proportional to the fitness. So if your VO2 max is twice um, average, then your heart will be twice as big. You know, with a bit of error, but but that's that's fairly true. Um, and that is quite remarkable because that means if your heart's twice as big, then during exercise it can fill twice as much and pump twice as much because the amount of time that it has to do that is the same whether you're an athlete or a non-athlete. You know, the, your maximum heart rate is, is essentially the same. That doesn't change um, with training essentially. So the main changes are that your heart gets bigger um, it remains just as strong and just as um, uh, we call it sort of elastic, you know, that ability to fill at least as good, if not better. Now, in turn, uh, what are the downsides of, um, of endurance exercise? So there's been a lot of attention given to the fact that after you do a long endurance event and particularly events that are prolonged and intense, so we tend to see these changes in things like triathlon and cycling, perhaps a bit more than running events, um, simply because running events, your muscles, you know, you, you just become so jarred and things that it's hard to go at a really high intensity for a really long period. But if you, if you um, uh, do any high intensity exercise for more than three hours and, and particularly more than five hours, then if we look at the heart afterwards, you can clearly see that there's fatigue of the heart. And we can also measure from blood tests, um, things like troponin, which is a protein in the heart muscle, which suggests that there's a small amount of damage that takes place. Now, anyone who's an athlete will know that if you go you know, running or whatever, you'll have sore, um, tender muscles if you do it hard and long enough. So the idea that your muscle becomes damaged is not such a new thing and it always recovers. And the heart is a little bit the same. It can be damaged um, or fatigued, and it tends to always recover. The, the thing that we've, we think we've seen or that we speculate is that if you, um, uh, if you exercise repeatedly without providing enough recovery, then then it's possible that you can have a sort of overtraining syndrome of the heart, which can manifest as poor training, you know, fatigue, or, or in the worst case scenario, it can cause heart rhythm problems. And in terms of the worst, you know, the things that we worry most about is that in endurance athletes, there is an increased risk of, of heart rhythm problems. Um, mostly the sort of more, uh, what we'd say, benign or safe end of the spectrum, things like a rhythm called atrial fibrillation, which is, which is not a nice rhythm problem to have, but it never causes people to die suddenly. And then more controversially, there's some thought that, that, um, that athletes might even have some of the more serious arrhythmias um, more frequently. But again, and this is where I come right back to the beginning, is that that small sting in the tail or that small downside from being an athlete is, um, uh, is you know, small versus the health benefits. Because, you know, as I said, clearly athletes live longer. So if there is an increased problem with these heart rhythm um, disturbances, then they, they occur in a small number of athletes and tend not to cause, you know, really serious health effects.
And and could they possibly have been susceptible to, to heart issues anyway? Is it those kind of people who may have been susceptible to it anyway? Yes, yeah, so that's an excellent question. We That's one of the things that we're trying to work out is whether, so in, in broad terms, we talk about sort of environmental and genetic effects. So being predisposed, there's a number of reasons why you might be, um, but one of the main ones is is inherited traits. So, you know, that you're born with a predisposition to have an arrhythmia, say, um, and then if you combine that with exercise, that might bring it out earlier or might bring it out where it wouldn't have otherwise. So we're particularly with um, a heart rhythm problem called atrial fibrillation, which is one of the most common heart rhythm problems in generally in society. And it seems to be about three times more common in endurance athletes. So we're looking at their, at um, an athletes with atrial fibrillation and seeing if we can find an underlying genetic predisposition sort of a double hit phenomenon. You have yeah. the genetic risk and then you throw into it, you know, thousands of kilometres of training and, and voila, you have atrial yeah. fibrillation. And and you talked about one of them that is it doesn't, won't cause you to die unexpectedly. How would someone even know that they have it? Do they, can they feel it? <laughs> Yeah, so there's there's some sort of um, unfortunately there's there's occasionally athletes who who don't feel anything and and can suddenly have a heart problem. That's true of um, the general community and athletes. Sometimes the very first symptom you have is is a very serious one, but much much more commonly, um, athletes will have. Um, symptoms and typical typical symptoms that would be red flags or that would suggest that you should see your doctor would be um, any feeling of palpitations of the heart racing, particularly if they sort of suddenly start. People might, for example, a fairly typical thing would be someone coming in and saying, all of a sudden, click of the fingers, I felt like my heart was... Um, beating fast and beating out of my chest. I looked at my heart rate monitor and it said 240 and I felt like all the blood had drained out of my legs and I suddenly felt heavy. You know, it's, it's not uncommon for someone to give me a description like that that's, that's you know, perfect and almost without knowing anything else, I know that no, arrhythmia has happened or, or a heart rhythm problem. But it's not always that perfect. So really any feeling like the heart's sort of jumping around. Um, other red flags would be would be chest pain, um, uh, and really that again can be the typical sort of chest heaviness going down down the arm or into the jaw. But sometimes um, sometimes can be really quite bizarre uh, pains or feelings. Um, the other the less specific one would be exercising um, sort of intolerance, and I, I forgot to say an important one is is if people, um, if people suddenly lose consciousness or feel like they're about to lose consciousness. Now, they're all important red flags or reasons to see your doctor. If you have any of those, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're in strife. Um, mm -hmm. For example, the most common reason people lose consciousness is what we call vasovagal or simple fainting. Um, and, and that's, you know, 90% of cases. So it's not saying if you faint, you're, you're at death's door, far from it. It's more if you, if you have a faint, you should see your doctor and we'll work through it and, you know, the chances are that we're giving you a pat on the back and reassurance, but that's also a good reason to see your doctor because one, one of the nice things we get to do is to take the little voice out of athletes' heads, you know, that sort of, geez, are you all right? Something serious could happen. And if you're told otherwise, then it makes exercise more more enjoyable and yeah. safe. Yeah, no, that, that's fair enough. So um, as an athlete, um, when they're exercising, what is the difference on the heart between doing things like just steady state endurance running versus, you know, VO2 intervals and that sort of thing? What effect does that have? So the basically the harder, the, as I said, the harder the exercise, the more work that the heart has to do. But um, on the other hand, the, at the very high levels of exercise, the body can't sustain it. You know, so so if you go out and do hill sprints or something, then that's for a short while making the heart work as hard as it can. Um, but it's it's for a short period of time, whereas 
sort of time trial efforts or that sort of, you know, around ventilatory or anaerobic threshold that can be sustained in some cases in well-trained people for many hours. Um, that's, that's when the heart has to work very hard, 70, 80% of its maximum, and just keep doing it yeah. um, without really much in the way of recovery. And then the, if I was to classify that way, and then the third type of exercise, I know there's you know, variation in yeah. between, but would be sort of long, slow exercise. So things like you know, multi-stage trail running or, 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 or long hiking or, or you know, things like that, where the heart is having to work harder than rest, but not, not, you know, not super hard. And our experience is that in that, if I start with that last group first of the really long, you know, many, many hours or even day, you know, long sort of competitions, the heart tends to cope with that pretty well. You know, it's a bit like we've been designed for millennia for, you know, as hunter-gatherers, that we're, we're actually very good at keeping moving um, uh, and, and, you know, at a, at a low to moderate intensity, we can go forever. If I go to the other end, the short, sharp exercise, the kind of, if you like, high-intensity interval training type or, or, or um, you know, hill sprints or whatever, the heart also copes with that very well. It's certainly put under a lot of stress, but for a short period of time and recovers very well. What we consistently find is that it's those sort of long, intense bouts uh, that, that cause the most heart fatigue and really need to be kind of treated with respect in your training and racing. If, you, if you're training every day, like, for example, the Tour de France, where, you know, for three weeks, um, cyclists... Um, you know, are, are doing three, four, five hours of exercise and a lot of that at quite high intensity. If that race were to go for six, seven weeks, you would have athletes really getting themselves, you know, the vast majority of cyclists would probably be getting into a heavy overtraining sort of spiral and, and I'm sure that heart function would not be, would not be great. Yep. So it's not, I'm not saying that you can't uh, do, you know, um, essentially that, that sort of long, long race rather than ultra endurance, but sort of long race. It's not that you can't do it. It's just that it should be treated with respect, with, with um, adequate recovery, both in training and, and racing. Yeah, yeah. And that's right. Sometimes even though we feel, I think we feel okay, there's, um, dam you know, fatigue and damage in the body that needs to repair and recover. And, and on that yeah. note, you, you said earlier that um, after a, a race, that there is, um, or after a long, hard effort, there is fatigue of the heart. And like, just say we've done a 100 miler race, you know, 24 hours or whatever it is. How long can we expect, generally, that the heart would take to recover from that? Well, it um, certainly we we can measure heart fatigue for a few days afterwards. Mm. Um, in one one athlete where we who did who set a world record for twenty four hours cycling, we could still see heart fatigue weeks later. Um, so we're we're talking about um, you know days to weeks. Again, the thing that the thing that I think is somewhat protective about running is that after you do a hundred miler, you generally can't go out two days later and do you know a flat out marathon nice. um, because your skeletal muscles just shot. Uh, whereas with cycling and triathlon, particularly sort of cycling, some of these you know other other events that don't have the same eccentric muscle damage. Then, then you really can go out, you know, two days later and, 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 and flog yourself again. Yeah. And it's interesting because people who wear a heart rate monitor will be used to the sort of phenomenon of doing a race, let's say, let's say a bike race, and then two days later going out to do a training session, to do a training session that normally at 30 kilometres now they'd be sitting at 110 beats and at exactly the same intensity they're sitting at 135 beats. And that's really the heart, um, you know, still fatigued or, or, or um, you know, struggling. And, and I think that if there's one, you know, one really important take-home message, it's, it's to sort of treat the heart 
heart with respect. Athletes get very used to treating the muscles and the bones with respect because they get sick of getting stress fractures and but you don't feel your heart. And so you've got to you've got to keep it in mind in your in your sort of training plans. Yeah, no, totally agree. <clears throat> so um what role does nutrition play in, in the health of our heart? Um probably more than than we than we realise. I mean, there's not been a heap of research on on this, at least in not a lot in athletes. So a lot of the nutrition studies, for example, with the sort of current uh, controversy about about um, carbs versus sort of a, a carb-free diet, for example, um, there's been some very interesting studies done, um, which I won't go into so much, but people haven't really tagged on to that um, cardiovascular uh, measurements. So, um, for example, Louise Burke in, in Canberra has done a done a lot of um, studies on on um, on high fat diets versus mm -hmm. carbohydrates, and has shown that um, that high fat diets uh, tend the performance tends to fall and stress markers tend to go up. Now. Pretty much everything that we know, like high altitude training, like not enough sleep, like you know, metabolic stress, um, all contribute to um, all contribute to to making it easier to get cardiac fatigue. So, for example, instead of getting um, a certain amount of cardiac fatigue at three hours, you might get it at two and a half or something like that. And and so I guess there's a bit of a cop out answer having not done enough research on the nutrition, it would be that that it's really important to keep the body well fueled um, when exercising. And and for me, my bias would be that carbohydrates are, are an important part of that both before and during. Because mm. there are they are the the heart's an interesting muscle in that it it metabolizes things slightly different to skeletal muscle and relies a lot on fatty acids and then um, doesn't like to switch to, to, to glucose. But if the body starts running out of, out of substrates or running out of food on which to, um, to run the muscles, that's a really bad situation for the heart, both in terms of um, kind of antioxidants and nasties running around in the system, but also just, um, it, it starts to run out of food itself. Oh, okay. So, you know, bonking, if you like, or running out of, running out of energy is, um, is not a nice feeling, but it also has implications for the heart. What about, say, it's dehydration also, as well? Yeah, dehydration is dehydration's interesting. It's, um, it's also gone through fads, those, those old mm -hmm. sayings that lose 2% of your body weight and lose you know, 30% of your performance or something is, um, has clearly been debunked when um, all, of the, all of the marathon runners on average lose more, you know, all of the world records lose more than 2% of, of fluid. But, but certainly becoming um, both ways, becoming dehydrated or fluid overloaded and hyponatremic, both of them have, have implications for the heart. So it's, it's not... It's not really a surprise that the things that are important for performance are also important for you know good heart health, but good nutrition and good hydration is is you know really important. Good good heat management is another one. Uh, you know the heart doesn't like being overheated, um, uh, and so keeping yourself cool is really important. When when you overheat, the the heart has to pump blood not only to the muscles but also a lot of blood to the skin to cool you down. And that's probably quite a bit of the reason as to why, again, all of the marathon world records have been set in the sort of five to 10 degree mark rather than the 15 to 20 and certainly not the 30 to 35. All of those place a lot of, a lot of stress on the heart. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. And, and um, I certainly know it, it's generally just more comfortable in general when it, when it's cooler. And that's probably part of that too. <clears throat> what about when an athlete is in, um, deep into a race, you know, some of these longer races and they're having heaps of sugar and caffeine and, and those sorts of things, does that have any effect on the heart too? 
I don't think so. Uh, caffeine's interesting in that it um, it's been it's one of the great old wives' tales. You know, if you have if you have five coffees, you're going to have heart rhythm problems. When when there's been quite a lot of research done on that, and and there's really very little association between caffeine, at least at reasonable levels. You know, six six cups even uh, a, a sort of equivalent, um, and there's not been a problem. And similarly. There's, there's a bit of it, you know, it's a weak carbohydrate um, sparing agent. So it tends to mean that you burn more fat and spare some of the carbohydrates and that's good for, good for performance and probably good for the heart. And similarly, during races, you know, all things in moderation, I'm not saying have, you know, have 20 no-dos or something like that, but certainly some caffeine or, or even some caffeine tablets, we're not aware of that causing any problems. That's good to know. Um, so what happens to our heart, say, if we've had a really stressful day at work and, you know, then we go for a run and run hard? Does that sort of have like a double impact on, on the heart? Or is it good for oh, it? Yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult to say. I mean, stress is one of the hardest things for us to quantify. And we, we use the word, we use the word stress sometimes you know, sometimes if you've got a lot of things on your mind or a lot of emotional build-up, my personal sort of feeling is you go for a run and, and you can sometimes get you start to get your head around them. So um, it's a stress reliever. Mm. Sure, you know, everyone, I'm sh sure that many people who have done sport for a long time will report the times when they go away on holiday and they suddenly find that their their performance and their training improves a lot because there's able to get some sleep and proper eating at the right times and there's no stress and um, that I'm certain that plays a role and in the ideal world you would be able to take all of those stressors out of life but but we just can't can we I mean everyone you've got families we've got jobs we've got everything for most of us and so um, I think there's two sides to that one is one is to be realistic with your training. You know, don't don't try to train necessarily like you do when you're on holidays, or train like that other person down the road who's got half a job. You know, you you just have to be sensible because it's easy to get into a um, vicious circle where you where you're working hard and training hard, and you're getting worse rather than better. Um, so I think I, I think if again if people are smart, if you're really stressed and you're really for me, it's not a reason not to run, but it might be a reason to run for a little bit less of a distance and, and to take it easy and, and you know, use it as meditation rather than a main training session. If it's if People often have one or two sessions a week where they've got to get themselves up for it. You know, the session itself is a stress. You, you, you want to do, you know, kilometre reps or something and, 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 and it's really sort of has you agitated leading up to it. That might be one where you want to cut back your work or not have a stress, you know, do it on a day when work's not just completely over the top. But as much as you can, putting stress of work, blending into exercises, stress reliever and et cetera, is the better, I think. Mm. I'm, and, I'm um, not sure how much of that's guided by cardiologists and how much of that's just guided by a little bit of um, experience and trying to, yeah. you know, try to run whilst being very busy <laughs> yeah no no that that's fair enough and you mentioned sleep before what does the effect of, of sleep have um on our heart health you know some people who who when they're really busy and and trying to fit in runs and getting up at the crack of dawn and then working all day you know and us cutting back on sleep what can what effect can that have on our heart health well, a lot of a lot of things happen during sleep, and and a lot of the um, most important recovery is done during sleep. So, mm -hmm. things like um, insulin growth factor and uh, and and growth hormone, these type of um, if you like anabolic substances or, or repair substances that the body produces, they they gener they disproportionately happen when you sleep. And um, if you like, it's it's kind of um, when you exercise, you're draining the battery. When you're not exercising, then then it's being recharged, but very slowly you go to sleep and it's on the supercharger. 
And so you cut back on sleep and you're losing your recovery. And if you don't have enough recovery and you're stressing the engine again, then you can run into trouble. So when, when, when I consider the balance between um, exercise stresses or if you like exercise damage and then, um, and then relaxation and recovery, sleep is a key part of that. And before when I sort of said when you're on holidays, all of a sudden you, you find that your performance steps up a notch, I reckon sleep is, is a huge part of that. Yeah. It really is. Um, it, it it really is quite key. Yeah, yeah. I uh, certainly noticed with um, isolation, I'm getting more sleep, and I, I certainly feel better when I'm running. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I, I I remember some pro cyclists saying to me, and and um, subsequently it's in my head, and I, I think it's true, is that if you haven't had much sleep and then you have a really big night's sleep, you often feel terrible that yeah, next day. Yeah, that's true. Like, yep. like the body just goes into a hyper recovery and you just are so lethargic. Yeah. Um, whereas the opposite is probably also true for all those people who can't sleep the night before a marathon. It probably doesn't really matter if you've had good sleep leading up to it, then, you know, don't get too worried about the fact that the night before you tossed and turned. Then I start stressing about the night before the night before, because they say that's the important one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I know, so do I. So you, you, it's just, um, I don't know, make sure you get as good a sleep as you can for, for a fair while, I suppose. Yeah, that's it. No, that's fair enough. Now, do you have any um, sort of tips or, or advice for people, just general, obviously, um, related to, to looking after their hearts so that they can exercise for as long as they possibly can? Yeah, so, so the, 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 one of the biggest tips I'd probably say is for those people who are middle-aged or beyond is that consistency is absolutely key. So when you're young, um, and it's enjoyable, but when you're young, you can do stupid stuff. You know, you can just not train for three weeks and then go out with your friends and have the hardest mountain bike ride for six, eight hours, go home and sort of pass out on the couch. When you get to middle age and beyond, you're putting yourself at risk doing those sort of things. So you so you need to not say, um, you know, you can still go out and smash yourself for six, eight hours on a mountain bike, but you need to build up to that over months and, and you know, one, two hours, three hours. And, and it may become a bit more boring um, and, and more predictable, but it's really key. It's a bit, I often tell um, people to think of your heart a bit like your Achilles tendon. And, and so many people have had calf problems once you become a middle-aged or older runner and, and become very used to the fact that if you, if you go running up Mount Danong hard, having not run for five weeks, you're going to, you're going to have Achilles problems, you know, mm. five times out of 10 or something. And, and that's the same approach I tell people, especially once they've had a heart problem is not to put a limit on what their goal is, but to really plan the way to get there. So if someone's had, for example, if someone's had a heart attack and they come in and say, I've always dreamt of running the London Marathon, can I do it? My answer is absolutely you can, but you need to set that goal 12 months or even two years away and just start building really gradually. There's this thing called the exercise paradox, which is that exercise is good for you, it's good for your heart, but every single bout of exercise constitutes a, a risk, particularly when it's out of the blue. You know, the the midweek, the, what they call the businessman's game of squash. You know, they, they sit on the, they, they do no exercise and then they compete against their colleague on a Wednesday and they have a heart attack. So you, you need every bout of exercise to be somewhere within the norm or when you do it, you just stretch yourself a little bit. So consistency is absolutely the key. Yeah, and, remember, and that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, yep. one of my friends uh, who's, a, who's a podiatrist, um, said to me one, one day, um, he said, 37. I said, what are you talking about? He said, 37. It's the day when you've got to start being consistent. <laughs> and I don't know why specifically 37, but I often laugh about it. But it's, it's really a key message, I think, beyond middle age. Um, you, you, and it even means things like if you're going to run a marathon, I would, when I was younger, would run a marathon and then have a month or something of doing very, very little and then getting back into it. Whereas now, 
I, I, you know, drop off after a marathon, but I still try to run every day or most days, just less and less intense. But so there's not much variation on a month to month basis. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. No. And, and I mean, it, consistency is good for, for all the whole body, I guess, as well, not just the heart too. So that's really yeah. good advice. Um, and what about when you're talking about, you know, middle aged to older athletes, um, should they be worried about doing high intensity work? No, not at all. In fact, I think again, it's a it's an important part of health. But you know, again, it's this consistency thing. So you don't mm. so like I wouldn't I wouldn't watch TV and sort of see a high intensity interval workout and say right, I'm going to do all of that tomorrow. You just take sort of small bites into everything, and it might seem boring, but it's the best way of preventing heart problems. It's the best way of preventing injury in general. So yeah. I would definitely be trying to incorporate some high intensity sort of exercise into um, into my exercise campaign until the day I drop. But um, it'll just be you know, have to stay consistent. The other thing is that what I think we've learned with high intensity interval training is that it doesn't have to be long. So you can get a lot of the benefits and the enzyme changes and the muscle adaptation um, with just very short bouts. You know, some people say as little as, you know, 15, 30 seconds, but probably, you know, a couple of minutes. Um, mm. the, the people who pioneered the sort of concept of high intensity interval training sort of was this four by four minute uh, concept. But it probably doesn't need to be uh, as long as that, you know, four by one minute or four by two minutes of, of high intensity is is a really good regime you know once a week in amongst the rest of the training yeah yep no that's fair enough all right well thank you so much i really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us and i'm sure everyone's learned a lot from that one pleasure no, thank, thank you, you as well. bye okay.